go forward. My name is Daniel Vallis and welcome to our channel. We've been studying the time of when Christ was offered to bear the sins of many and how this time is important for us to understand what happened that first time as we look for him to appear the second time without sin and to salvation, deliverance. This time, this whole context around these events when Christ came the first time are pivotal for us to understand how we should be looking and when we should be looking for him to return the second time. And the more that we study it, the more we see the references throughout the New Testament pointing back to the pictures that were established here. And where we are right now is a time of redemption. I've said this so many times because there are so many pictures packed into this little window where we are right now, a time of redemption. And that should always remind us we've been told to look up, to lift up our heads, and we will know that our redemption draweth nigh. It's up ahead, and that's what we've seen. We've seen the Lord work in incredible ways with celestial signs, prophetic events, and especially working in our own lives as well, bringing us, drawing us to this time of redemption. We know we should be looking, we should be expecting our redemption when we see those things transpire. So we're not surprised that we've been brought to a time that the whole theme is about redemption, particularly our redemption, when the Lamb of God was offered to bear the sins of many. And as we dive into the richness of the depth that is at this time, we see so many things reminding us this is a time of expectation. This is a time we know our redemption draweth nigh. We should be expecting our Redeemer. And we know that he has led us and brought us to this place. And when we zoom in on where we are right now, we've been looking at the time of Christ's first coming, when it was announced that the king came, and the warnings and instructions that he gave to his disciples in the intermediate days after he came, just hours after he came, he was giving his disciples new instructions for when he would be coming and appearing the second time. While that was still fresh in their minds, and as we saw in the context, there's a lot of lessons when we see it in context of when those instructions were given. And then we saw the Last Supper, and then when he was offered at the crucifixion, when he was buried and then rose again, and then he became our high priest, going into the heavenlies and fulfilling the Day of Atonement pictures, the types. And we've seen a lot that reminds us of this time, and of course it builds upon what had happened historically previous with Exodus and the Passover lamb, and the children of Israel being brought forth out of Egypt. And Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, was taking those pictures and types to the next level. And so when we understand the historical context, how it all applies together, we understand what Christ was fulfilling with the types and also what he was referencing that the Jewish people were familiar with. So it does us good to study it all in context, how this time starts with Passover, but then that immediately goes into the days of unleavened bread, which at the time of Exodus ended with the crossing of the Red Sea, the deliverance. And this is an important picture for us to remember. This time period spans eight days from the time the Passover lamb was slain to the time when the Israelites were brought out of the cities of Egypt at Ramses, and then they traveled for several days, and it wasn't until the end of the Days of Unleavened Bread that they were actually leaving the land of Egypt. So they weren't fully delivered from the land of Egypt until the last day of Unleavened Bread. And who was led forth on the last day? They sang about it in Exodus 15. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. They were a redeemed people. And it does us good to consider when were they redeemed. When was the Passover sacrifice made? It was made on the 14th. But several days transpired before they were delivered out of the cities of Egypt and in the land of Egypt. Interesting parallels for us as Christians. We have a Passover lamb. We are waiting to be brought forth out of Egypt still though. We are waiting our redemption, the conclusion of our redemption. Fear and dread shall fall upon them by the greatness of thine arm. They shall be as still as a stone till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. Interesting picture when we consider in context. They were a redeemed and purchased people on the night of Passover. But that redeemed and purchased people saw their full deliverance a few days later when they were brought out of Egypt. Interesting parallels to a redemption of a purchased possession. This time also is the wave offering. And several days ago over there in Israel, different groups harvested the first fruits of barley for the wave offering. A reminder how Christ became the first fruits for us as well at this time. This is a time of first fruits, and the New Testament likens those who put their faith in Jesus Christ as first fruits, with Christ being the first fruits of them that slept. He was the first one to raise from the dead, and we in like picture, because Jesus Christ is our mediator, we are first fruits like Christ. 
So where we are right now is an incredible time when we consider the death. What does it mean Christ was offered to bear the sins of many? He was fulfilling so many pictures and patterns and it was at a time spread across multiple days. And this is a time we've been brought to, a time of redemption. We are looking for him to appear the second time. Keeping in mind, we are a purchased possession, but we have not been fully delivered from this Egypt, this world yet. We are awaiting our deliverance. We are waiting for him to appear the second time without sin unto salvation, deliverance from this world. We are awaiting the redemption, the pickup of something that's already been purchased. And so this is an incredible time that spans all these pictures. It wraps them all up and brings them all together. And this is what we are expecting in our time. This is what we're told to look for and expect and watch. We've also looked at the parallels with Daniel's seven weeks prophecy that has also brought us right to this time. And we remember how he told us to watch. So this is a time of watching when we are expecting him to come this second time. Just like Daniel's seven weeks prophecy prophesied when he would arrive the first time. So multiple things tell us this time is very important. We've also talked about how the enemy is drawing a lot of attention to this too. They do know what time it is. They also know it's an expected time. We're at the end of the last generation. We're in the 70th year right now. It's actually coming to a close pretty soon. Israel's getting ready to celebrate their anniversary of the finish of 70 years. So this time where we are right now, the time of Christ's first coming, this is the last commemoration of Christ's first coming within a 70 year last generation. This time is very important, and it should not surprise us that the celestial signs, the prophetic signs, the geopolitical signs, so many things have brought us right to this very point. It is a high time of expectation. And it also caught our attention on April 4th, which was the same day as the resurrection, that Google put out a very suspicious Google Doodle, very blatantly pushing the concept of I rise, I rise, I rise. About Dr. Angelou's birthday on April 4th, but they're emphasizing a famous poem that she wrote, which strongly hearkened to a lot of things that Satan said. Very suspicious it being read and pushed at this time. The enemy does know what time it is. This whole concept of rising, and that's what Satan wants to do, rise above the sides of the north. But multiple concepts that hinted at the enemy's concept of their Apollo God, which they are expecting. They are expecting him to rise from the ashes. They're a phoenix god too. They know what time it is. They know celestially what time it is. They know that the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, is about to be revealed. He's about to appear the second time. And shortly after that, the Son of Perdition will be revealed. And he'll come onto the scene with all sorts of lying wonders. They are looking at this time because they are expecting the one who's coming after Christ appears. They are looking for their Apollo figure. They know what time it is and that this is a time of expectation. Do we know what time it is? Are we watching what scripture tells us to watch for? And we studied historically how this is the time Christ came. The king cometh is announced with his triumphal entry and Passover and resurrection. But we also have to consider and remember that this is also the time of the unleavened bread that follows immediately after Passover. And it is a vital part of the historic story with Exodus, which as we study the parallels for us as Christians, we see it's a vital part of our story as well. In Exodus 12 verse 14, it says, And this day, talking about Passover day, shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation. And in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done of you. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this self same day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance for ever. Okay, the Lord has given the instructions for how they were going to commemorate an event that was just about to happen. It hadn't even happened yet. But he told them that they were going to commemorate how on this selfsame day, the Lord was going to bring their armies, bring them out by orderly ranks, out of the land of Egypt. And this is important for us to consider. Did they leave the land of Egypt on the very first day, Passover? No. They left the cities of Ramses on the 15th day, but it wasn't until the end of the days of unleavened bread that they were actually brought out of the land of Egypt when they left the borders of Egypt. So Passover and unleavened bread, that whole time commemorates the redemption and deliverance process. When the Passover lamb was slain, when they were redeemed, when they were purchased, and then the steps to their deliverance that happened several days later. 
this entire time from the beginning with passover to the end of the days of unleavened bread that entire time commemorates and brings to remembrance for the hebrew people this process of purchasing and deliverance and redemption so this is what we need to keep in mind when we look at the days of unleavened bread a lot of times it just kind of gets skipped over people just saying oh yeah jesus fulfilled the days of unleavened bread and then they forget about it but no it's very important because it is critical to understanding the story of exodus when were they purchased and when were they delivered for us jesus christ became our first fruits he purchased us we are still waiting for our redemption we're still waiting for our deliverance those pictures are in the feast of unleavened bread and that's actually what's commemorated within that time he told them the first day of unleavened bread on the 15th and then the last day on the 21st both of those are going to be holy convocations assemblies they are going to assemble together and he emphasized this is to help you remember when i brought you forth out of the land of egypt on the 15th they left the cities of egypt and on the 21st they left the land of egypt now in the jewish tradition that grew over the years the kadesh cup plays a vital part of these important ceremonies the cup of blessing and this is what the disciples would have been very familiar with that was already used and that had already been brought into his commemoration remembering what the lord did during the time of exodus and when we consider what the disciples were already familiar with this time the seven days that followed passover when they had the last supper with christ keep in mind for them every single day for seven days after the last supper they were remembering and seeing the exact pictures that christ gave them to remember him by to remember his blood to remember his body to do it in remembrance of him and when we keep in mind that these pictures were rehearsed for seven days after the last supper that should tell us something he wants us to remember this picture till he comes especially at this time especially at these days that follow passover and even the time when he was buried and resurrected too all the way up until the end these pictures were rehearsed for the disciples rehearsed for the early church they saw the incredible pictures the tapestry of redemption that were in the days of unleavened bread after passover reminding them that yes we are a purchased people jesus christ died for us he was offered to bear the sins of many at passover he became our first fruits at the beginning of the feast of unleavened bread he rose again from the dead during the time became our high priest we are just awaiting the conclusion of the story that is based on the feast of unleavened bread do you get that the hebrew people at exodus they commemorated the feast of unleavened bread as a time span from when they were purchased to when they were redeemed as christians we can look at the feast of unleavened bread as it should remind us of the process from our purchasing to our redemption when we are expecting him to appear the second time without sin unto salvation unto our deliverance unto our redemption from this egypt from this world and this is what he wants us to remember him by and so when we're at a time that repeatedly reminds us this is what we should be remembering let's dive deeper into why this picture is repeated at this time we understand more about our redemption and our expectation of our redeemer we've been told in so many ways that redemption draweth nigh and here we are at a time where we should be expecting the conclusion of the redemption story which ends at this time the crossing of the red sea the deliverance the leading out of the land of egypt happened at this very end of the feast of unleavened bread a holy convocation to remind the hebrew people of what had happened in the days before that and how it was finished at that time likewise for us as christians we can use the end to remember the beginning and also remind us of what our expected conclusion is too and when god gave the hebrew people the instructions he told them that the very last day the feast of unleavened bread it was a holy convocation but it was specifically called a feast to the lord on the very end day they were going to have a feast to the lord to remember what he did over the previous days so let's not shortchange the feast of unleavened bread let's not just ignore all these pictures here let's remember and see how the last days the end of this picture is at this time here where we look back at what had happened over the previous days realizing there is a conclusion there is an expected end to what had happened on the previous days so right now especially let's remember our lord what he did and then let's look for him to appear the second time till he comes when we're at a high time where we're expecting our redemption we know it's nigh it's even at the doors and here at a time of conclusion we are expecting our redemption it's a time where we remember everything that our lord has done for us 
And it's important to view the context that the Hebrew people view this feast to the Lord because they consider Jehovah himself as the host of the festival. And these convocations are times of meeting with him as well as meeting with one another. It's a convocation. It's assembly where they gather together, understanding that he's the host. He is present in power by his spirit to affect the spiritual significance of the feast into our lives. It is traditional at these gatherings to have a festive communal meal with a kadush of bread and wine. So even today, when they gather together at the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they gather together and they have the cup of blessing of bread and wine. Understanding it in context that it's a feast to the Lord, understanding that the presence of the Lord is the host of the Feast of the Lord. And so for us as Christians, when we consider the importance of a feast to the Lord, remembering the feast, the Last Supper, that the disciples had with them just a few days right before the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and here at the end is a feast that looks back what was done at the beginning. It's a conclusion to the story of what was previously started. And there are also very important scripture passages that are read on this last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The partial Hallel is recited, Psalms 113 through 18. Unlike all the other festivals, only the abridged version of Hallel, Psalms 113 through 18, is recited on special occasions in praise and thanksgiving to God. It is said on the latter days of Passover, they call the entire time from Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they colloquially refer to that entire time as Passover. So the partial Hallel is said on the latter days. And with the partial Hallel, the first 11 verses of Psalm 115 and 16 are generally omitted. It is recited on the last six days of Pesach, Passover, and on Rosh Kadesh. So this portion is what is read at the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the reason they read this is the Psalms of Hallel are closely related to the song that the Israelites sang at the Red Sea. A prayer of thanksgiving that both describes a personal experience of redemption and promotes worship at a central site where the glory and kingship of God can be proclaimed in public. So the reason they read it here at the end is because it so closely mirrors the song that the Israelites sang when they came through the Red Sea. And you remember those passages where they sang about how they were a redeemed, they were a purchased people. They were brought forth and that mirrors these psalm passages in the partial Hillel. And that's why it's read at this time. But it needs to catch our attention that within that partial Hillel, in Psalms 118, is verse 26. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Wow. Here at the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we have the reminder verses of what was proclaimed when Christ entered Jerusalem just a few days before this. The king cometh. They were singing Hosanna to him. That was hearkening to this very passage. At the beginning, on day 10, the triumphal entry. They were quoting from this passage. And here, at the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they're also reading that, and we have that reminder reminding us of when the king came right here at the very end of this story. What are we looking for? We are looking for him to appear the second time, keeping in mind when he came the first time. And we have a reminder right here of when he came the first time, reminding us about the expected conclusion. This is a time of remembrance where we remember what he did for us when he purchased us and that we are to look for him to appear to come a second time without sin unto salvation, the redemption of the purchased possession. But on top of all those pictures, on top of all these reminders, we also have the beautiful picture of the Song of Songs are also read at this time. They are traditionally read on the Sabbath during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This same passage which reminds us of our beloved. Why is that song at this time? During the Shabbat of Passover week, it is customary to read the ancient love song of King Solomon called the Song of Songs. In Jewish tradition, since Passover marks the time when our romance with God officially began, the sages chose this song to commemorate God's love for his people. And since Passover is also called the Festival of Spring, the song is also associated with creativity and hope associated with springtime. Song 2 Many have the custom to read the Song of Songs on the Shabbat of the intermediate to interbetween days of Passover, which includes the Feast of Unleavened Bread, before the morning Torah reading. If there is no Shabbat during the intermediate days, then the Song of Songs is read on the morning of the seventh day of Passover, which for them would be the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now for us today, there was a Shabbat in the intermediate days, so the Song of Songs would have been read on that day between the 6th and 7th of March. So again, an incredible picture reminder. We are expecting our beloved right here. We have a reminder of that on top of all these pictures, reminding us of what our Redeemer, our beloved, has done for us, and that we're expecting him to appear a second time. And we've been told he's not at the door. So many things telling us to expect our beloved at this time. 
and we've talked about it before chapter two song of solomon so many pictures that remind us this springtime when the flowers appear on the earth the singing of the birds the fig tree putting forth her green figs and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell this is the time to expect our beloved when he will say arise my love my fair one and come away this is what we are expecting our beloved our bridegroom the one who purchased us the one who gave his life for us we are expecting him to return and call us away and the song of solomon paints a beautiful picture of i am my beloved and my beloved is mine he has purchased us and this is also the time of a year we've been looking at these pictures the figs are green right now this is the springtime the flowers are blooming the birds are singing this is a time painted in this picture a time of expectation the grapes are tender they're just now putting forth they're very tender in the flowering stage and transitioning to the grapes this is a time painted in the song of solomon and our redeemer the lamb of god the one who purchased us he said when these things begin to come to pass all these prophetic signs when you see the time of the last generation when these things begin to come to pass then look up and lift up your heads you're going to see celestial signs that are going to tell you the story of your redeemer the one who purchased you and those celestial signs will tell you because you know the story that your redemption draweth nigh that redemption is the pickup of something that's already been purchased you've been paid for the passover lamb has been slain it's to bear the sins of many it's already been paid for you just need to be picked up you just need to be led out of the land of egypt and when you see all these things you will know your redemption your pickup draweth nigh and he said it right in context of a picture that he gave related to fig trees putting forth blooming again hearkening back to the exact same pictures painted in the song of psalm and a time when we are expecting him to say arise my love and come away we have seen the things we've been brought here we know this is a time we know he is nigh we are so close we know what he has done for us we know we are already purchased we are at a time that exudes redemption so many reminders of redemption remind us of what happened the first time christ came when he was offered to bear the sins of many We've been told to look for him, to expect him, and as we look and dive deeper into this time, we have greater expectation of the conclusion of what he started when he came the first time. There are so many pictures and historic events that come together. It's not boiled down to one day or even a few days. It's a time that marks when Christ came the first time, but there's also a time that marks the finish of the exact same pictures that Christ came to fulfill within this time too. It's multi-layered. We've looked at there is a portion when Christ came the first time, related to Daniel 7 weeks prophecy, when he entered as the king, the Messiah, when he presented himself as the Lamb of God, there are certain days that we associate with the offering portion of what Christ did for us. The crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection. There are days at the beginning, at the start, that remind us he was once offered, but then right overlapped with that is the time of remembrance. When he came, when he was offered, he said, I want you to remember me with these exact pictures here and then over the next seven days that exact same picture that he told now associate with me the disciples were reminded of that for seven days after those events took place and all during these days we need to remember that exact same picture that was instituted on the 14th on the passover there is a time of remembrance to remember when he came the first time but also to remember the pictures that he was using and building upon that goes back to exodus building at this time because he wants us to remember there is a start there is a time of purchasing there is a time when he paid our atonement but we also need to remember just like the original story all these types are based on with exodus we need to remember that there is an expected conclusion as well there is a time of redemption and that is remembered at the end of the story remembering and looking back to the beginning of the story it all goes back together when we remember how christ was offered to bear the sins of many it all encompasses these days a time of remembrance remember the start of what christ did but also to remind us there is a conclusion there is a finish there is an expectation this is where we are right now this is what we need to remember right now this is our hope this is our expectation we know he's not even at the doors and we see the richness of this tapestry of redemption that he has painted for us we are reminded of romans eight twenty two for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth and pain together until now and not only they but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the spirit even we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body we are awaiting the pickup we are awaiting the final conclusion we are already purchased we're just waiting for the pickup and this is what we groan inwardly about especially at this time it's been a long journey but we've been brought to a time where we should be expecting 
the redemption, the pickup of our body, the deliverance from this world, the deliverance from this Egypt. We have the first fruits of the Spirit that were started at this very time. And that reminds us of the promises of our Lord, of our Redeemer, and how he wants us to remember certain pictures about him and to remember him till he comes. Also keeping in mind what he's going to do when he comes. Ephesians 1.12 That we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Just like the thief on the cross, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ to be our mediator, the one who is offered to bear our sins, when we put our faith and trust in him, we are sealed with the spirit of promise. We are purchased. We become a purchased possession. Even though we are still here in Egypt, we are already purchased. And the Holy Spirit is given as an earnest, a payment, a gift on top of the purchasing price. It's in addition to the price. It's done as a gift to show he is good for his promises that he is going to come back and pick up what has already been purchased. And this is why the Holy Spirit is given to us, to remind us we are sealed, and that one day he is coming to pick up what he has purchased. And this is our hope. We are awaiting the redemption, the pickup of the purchased possession. I highly suggest you watch our video Exodus 2, The Redeemed Possession. This is our hope. This is the picture that is painted for us as believers. It's the story of Exodus, a purchased people being brought forth one day. You can find the link in the description box. The Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread was given to the Hebrew people to remind them that they were a redeemed people. With the events of Exodus, there was a Passover lamb that was slain on their behalf too. They were a redeemed people. They were guided to where the Lord was going to bring them, the promised land. They knew they were a redeemed people. They knew they were in transition from one location to the next. And they knew that this purchased, redeemed people would pass over. There was a moment when they knew they passed over. And when was that? That was the song of Miriam right after they passed through the Red Sea. They did not sing this song. They did not sing about being a purchased people led forth that had passed over. They did not sing that song until they passed over. Till the story was finished. Till they were brought out of the land of Egypt. And it reminds us of the commandment that God gave Moses. He told them, go forward. That's all you have to do at this point. It looks like you've been brought to the end, but go forward. It's a time of faith, but you've been brought to this very location. You've been led forth. You are redeemed people led forth to this very time, a time of redemption, a time of deliverance. And this is a time of passing over, a time of deliverance for a purchased people. And so likewise, as a redeemed and purchased people, we go forward. We press forward. We press toward the mark. We go forward in faith one day at a time because we know we've been brought to this place. We go forward in faith expecting the conclusion. This is what we are told to remember. We are told to remember what he did, what he started, that he purchased us with an understanding that there is a redemption that goes with the purchasing. There is a leading over. There is a passing over. This is our hope. This is our expectation. The adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. And that will take place when he comes, when he appears the second time. So this is a beautiful time when we remember what he did for us and also the conclusion. We have heard so many things that have told us, look up, lift up your heads, your redemption draweth nigh, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, go forward, draw nigh to him. And this is what he wants us to do right now, go forward in faith, we know the beginning of the story, we just need to follow him, we just need to draw nigh to him, this is what he wants us to do, cast off the works of darkness, put on the armor of light, draw close to his side, the side of the Lamb of God, our Redeemer, the Messiah, the King, our bridegroom, our beloved. Let's rise up. Let's trim our lamps. Let's look for him. Let's love him. And let's serve him. First and highest above all else. Maranatha.